My name's Ruth Bentley and this is my delightful husband, Steve. We're going to do the Bible reading this morning. We're continuing in 1 Kings. I'm going to be reading from the NIV. That's what Shabu's asked for today. And it's 1 Kings chapter 21. And it goes like this. Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth, the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it is close to my palace. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it is worth. But Naboth replied, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. So Ahab went home, sullen and angry, because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my ancestors. He lay on his bed, sulking, and refused to eat. His wife Jezebel came in and asked him, Why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? He answered her, Because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, Sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, said, Is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, placed his seal on them, and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city with him. In those letters she wrote, Proclaim a day of fasting and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people. But seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them bring charges that he has cursed both God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. So the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city did as Jezebel directed in the letters she had written to them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth in a prominent place among the people. Then two scoundrels came and sat opposite him and brought charges against Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth has cursed both God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned to death. Continuing from verse 15. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, she said to Ahab, Get up, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite that he, he'd refused to sell to you. He's no longer alive but dead. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard, where he has gone to take possession of it. Say to him, this is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says. In the place where dogs lick up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood, Yes, yours. Ahab said to Elijah, So you have found me, my enemy. I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. He says, I'm going to bring disaster on you. I will wipe out your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and that of Baasha, son of Ahijah, because you have aroused my anger and have caused Israel to sin. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says, dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and the birds will feed on those who die in the country. There was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. He behaved in the vilest manner 
by going after idols like the Amorites the Lord drove out before Israel. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. It's a bit of a change. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. Thanks, you, Boo. Good morning. Good to see you this morning and also to those of you who are joining us online. Uh, it is my absolute joy and privilege and also with a bit of trembling to share God's word with you this morning. Um, if you haven't picked it, we are at the very tail end of 1 Kings. We as a church have been going through 1 Kings and so we're coming towards the tail end of 1 Kings. What's going to happen? We're going to continue in Kings. Uh, one of the things I would love to, for us as a church to continue to grow in, and particularly as a leadership, is that we see all the scriptures God breathed, including two kings. So the temptation for those of us who are so grown up in particularly both Old and New Testament, it, it might be like, oh, it's sort of almost the same, isn't it? Well, maybe there'll be similar themes for sure, but because it's God's word, we pray that two kings will continue to form your hearts just as one kings has been doing as well. So... The 9 a.m. service is going to be uh, unpacking that, 10.30 service. There'll be the night service doing um, different themes from Kings and also in the small groups. So we would encourage you to travel along with us as we consider the next chapter or the next season in Kings. Now, last week, Cameron did an amazing job, a stellar job under God, to get us to consider the God of second chances. And today we get to see that in the life of Ahab, but particularly this morning, what I want us to consider is this, the gracious justice of God, the gracious justice of God. Would you join with me and pray? Father in heaven, I thank you for the joy and privilege to gather as your people this morning, whether if we're watching online or whether if it's here in person. We thank you that you've already been ministering to us through the songs, through communion, and now as we come under your word. Lord, help us to have humble hearts to hear, to receive. We thank you even today as the church calendar celebrates Pentecost Sunday. It's through the help of the Holy Spirit that these words can come alive. And so we pray for that. And Lord, I pray for myself, help. Help through the power of your Spirit. And I don't want this to be anything to do with me, but to be about you, Lord Jesus, and for your glory alone. Amen. Uh, last week, we left off where we had a king who was vexed and sullen. I love those words. I've tried to use it this week. It hasn't really worked. Now, today, we meet another friend, our friend that we've gotten to know a little bit, Ahab. Uh, he's come and heard, and particularly we hear firstly about this guy called Naboth. Naboth is Jezreelite. He has a vineyard in Jezreel. What's the whole point of this? Well, it's to say that his vineyard is right next to Ahab's palace. Historians say Ahab probably had a few palaces. This is one of them. Now, Ahab likes what he sees. And he wants it. Did you see that in verse 2? He says to Naboth, give me your vineyard. That's what I want. His idea and vision, perhaps, is to turn this vineyard into a veggie patch. Uh, maybe he has a grand plan uh, as a king to have some sort of palace to plate vision. We're not really sure. It's not in the text. But the idea is, he says to them, look, I want that. And I'll even give you a better vineyard. And if you're not happy with the vineyard that I'm about to give you, if you're not happy with that deal, let me pay you what it's worth. It sounds like a fair deal, particularly for those of us in our day and time. But I want you to imagine for a moment, you have had a property in your family for generations. 
And perhaps then a foreign investor or perhaps a government or something comes and says to you, we want to offer you some money because we want to build something else in there. What goes on in your heart? What goes on in my heart? Now remember though, there's another layer of this in the story of the Bible, which is far more important, which is Ahab is meant to be the king who's under a greater king, the Lord God of the Bible. And as the king of Israel, because it's mentioned here in the text, He should already be not doing this, but actually he should be very clear about a few things. What's that? Well, like I said, there's a few layers, right? Now, I want you to imagine the people who are hearing this are the people who are in exile, and they're hearing the story. This king is now revealing the very depths of how far he's moved away from God. It reveals the very depths of his own heart. Let me read a passage to you from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 21. It's up here on the screen. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkeys, or anything that is your neighbor's. And in contrast, in this passage, you have a king who sees it and wants it. In contrast, you have in verse 3, did you hear what Naboth said? What did he say? He said, the Lord forbids it. It's a really interesting thing, a king that should know better... You have this neighbor, his Naboth, who actually understands. He understands and he says, the Lord forbids. Uh, the language that he's using is saying, this, the Lord forbids. This land is actually was given from the Lord to my family. It's actually ultimately not mine. It belongs to the Lord God, Yahweh. He gave it to us. And so I can't actually go against what God has given. The Lord forbids. It's a moment of a contrast, a king who perhaps in that moment should say, oh, sorry about that, totally forgot about that law. But he doesn't. Now, there's also another layer of this. This is where um, historians talk about in the Bible about a, a theology that's around this particular passage. The audacity to swap a vineyard and turn it into a veggie patch. For us, it's like, what's the big deal? But in the story of the Bible, it is a big deal. See, in the story of the Bible, a vineyard is also the imagery that's given to the people of Israel. Uh, Such places like this in Isaiah chapter 5. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And then later on, also earlier on in Deuteronomy, God is actually speaking, and this is one of the things that comes up in Deuteronomy chapter 11. It's up here on the screen again. It talks about keeping the whole commandment of the Lord. It's making that as they move into this promised land to take possession. And this is something that God has given them. And talking about how this land is going to be a land of milk and honey. And then, verse 10, For the land that you're entering to take possession of it is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seeds and irrigated it like a garden of vegetables. See, what's going on here, the the author and the writer is saying, Ahab's spiritual deadness in his life is revealing his very heart. His heart is dead. That he's actually not wanting to follow what God has commanded specifically not to do. And not only that, on a deeper level, this language of planting a vegetable garden in a vineyard, it's like saying, for this particular king... He would rather become like the nation around him, like Egypt, like the good old days. In other words, he's actually enslaved by his own blindness. His heart desires to have something that is not his. This at the very heart of it is what we call idolatry. It's leading him to say, I want that. It's mine. Now, for us, it's easy for all of us as we look at this and go, I'm not after somebody else's veggie patch. Maybe you are, I don't know. But here's the thing, right? At the heart of it, it, we all fall into this trap, don't we? Where there's a sense of not feeling content. I want that. I want that more. I see that and I want to take it. We might never actually literally do it, but perhaps in our hearts we say it. And I will do whatever I can to get it. Now, like I said, I'm guessing most of you, maybe you don't look over across your neighbor's fence and go, I wish I had their veggie patch. Perhaps you do, I hope not. But on a very heart level, there are other things that call on our hearts, isn't it? That we say, I want that. I'm not content, Lord. Give me that. 
I wish I had that kind of, let's talk about just practical things before we get to the heart. I want that home. I wish my house was like this. Uh, maybe in our season of life. Um, I'm not going to look at anyone here. It includes myself. I want that coffee machine. <laughs> Joking around here. I'm going to try to keep going a bit more deeper here, okay? I wish I had that caravan. I wish I had that car. What about on a more emotional level? I wish my family was like theirs. I wish my marriage was like that. I wish my kids were like that. Oh, Lord, I wish my season of life was like their season of life. Now, I want you to know, pastors are not immune to this. I'm reading this text and going, yes, Lord, it's not good to covet. I got invited to a conference this week to, by a good friend of mine, and he said, come along, be my guest to this event. I arrive at this church building, and you know what I do? Look at that. Oh, they've got those speakers. Oh, I wish... Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and they had these amazing guest speakers there, and I get joy to meet some of them, and I'm like, man, I wish I could preach like them. Something going on in our hearts. We all fall into this trap. Now, Ahab, here's the answer. <laughs> the answer is, no, the Lord forbids... This has been in my generation as my family. And we have this real moment, like a little kid, it's like he puts his thumb in his mouth and he heads home. Right? In verse 4. Now, as you see in verse 4, it's like the layers of the story changes again. So for for Ahab, the conversation changes. Uh, He doesn't even mention about the Lord forbids. He actually talks about how this guy thinks it's an inheritance, it's not fair, and he's just sulking away in the corner. But he doesn't register. He's so blind to his heart, so blind to the reality. Why? It is because the Lord forbids. There's not what God commands in the Word, in the Bible, particularly for him in that time, the law. So the language here is this king is actually quite bitter. He's actually quite angry. He's pouting. Do you feel for him? Do you connect with him? Oh, poor Ahab. You know, in his room, not eating. I don't know if you ever feel that. When someone says to you, no. What's our response? When someone says no to you. And rightly so. And in comes Jezebel. So Jezebel, the queen, his wife, comes along and goes from bad to worse. Not just we're just evil. Now... She's wondering, why is this king so bitter? Why is he not eating food? And did you notice in the text here, the reason now changes again, where he literally just says in verse 6, he doesn't mention anything about the Lord forbids, he doesn't mention about the inheritance, he just says, hey, Naboth doesn't allow me to have it. In summary statement, he's saying, if this was an Australian kind of drama, this is the moment where you might hear her say, he might say something like this to her, oh, Jesse, it's not fair. It's not fair. He won't give me the vineyard. I even offered him money. It was a good deal. But he said, no, it's just not fair, Jesse. I don't know if that has ever happened in your home. Maybe that that kind of language where the story changes, where at the center of attention is the person who feels like it's not fair. It's just not fair. Jezebel, because of who she is, as you've already seen in the encounters, that she is a fiery woman. She turns around to this husband of hers who's sulky and says, Get up, man. Do you know who you are? You're the king of Israel. And then, did you see the way that she talks to him? Do you not govern Israel? And then as the text goes, did you hear what she says? These striking words, which shows that her own heart, I will give you the vineyard. The queen who worships Baal, the one whose agenda has always been to destroy the God of Israel, even any prophet that stands for the God of Israel. These destructive words is a posture showing in many ways what she's doing now in this moment is to say, I will be God. I'll take care of it for you. She forges a scroll. You see that in verse 8. She even uses her husband's seal as the king. In many ways, what she's doing is she's taking the position of a king. She stands and sends these letters. She even does this thing of where she says in the passage, she calls a fast. 
She calls for this sort of fake kind of repentance and, and it almost sounds like a real kind of sense of justice. Maybe is to make sure it's the right thing done as this, this edict is sent out. Even the leaders of the time in that city, they're called to this meeting and all of this plan is filled with deception, it's betrayal, it's destructive. Her words in this are evil and deceptive and ultimately to get what she wants but also to get what her husband wants. She's declaring she's going to deliver an unjust justice, determined by her terms. And now in the passage, this is where, if you were an earlier reader, you'd be going, what are the leaders doing? Why are they complying to this? And the leaders themselves, they don't argue. They're happy to comply to it. It's coming from the king, right? Well, reality shows in the text they already know it's actually not from the king. It's eventually from the queen. The very notion of a fast to display repentance, this language of turning back, even putting the main person here, Naboth, at the head of the table, it sounds really pious, sounds really religious, but it's all deceptive, it's all destructive to ultimately achieve an evil plan, to do injustice. So we have false witnesses, you have criminals, they're set at the table, the plan is ready. As it happens at this meeting, then comes the false accusation. The false accusation is Naboth has cursed God and the king, which is really interesting because here's this king who's not following the law, but all of a sudden you've got this queen declaring, oh yeah, this guy here, he cursed the God. Do you know what the law requires? Wanting to follow the law when it suits them using it and twisting and turning to bring injustice. And so, the man is stoned. Naboth is killed. We don't even hear a word of defense from Naboth. He's murdered. This is unjust that is delivered. Now, outside the city, he's taken, he's stoned, and the word gets back that the judgment has finally happened. This false judgment. What's interesting in all of this is although it's Ahab's seal, like I said, in the passage you'll see that Jezebel is the one who's leading this. It's all her destructive plan to achieve this unjust action. It's evil. It's not just at all. So Ahab is now happy. Oh, thanks, Jezzy. I've got the vineyard. He gets what he wants at the very cost of a life. One life desires to honour God and he's killed. The other two lives desire selfish gain at all cost and their hands are filled with blood. In all of the secrecy that's going on in this nation and all the, the, the twisting and turning and forging little letters and being sent out, getting false witnesses, we know that someone is watching and I don't know about you, when you read these kind of passages, some of us might go, well, this is a bit hard to take. There's maybe some of us crying out already, that's just not fair. Maybe some of us are reading this and going, enough is enough. And so in that moment, the writer gives us what God does. The true word comes. The word of the Lord comes to Elijah. And he's commissioned to go. And if you see the passage in here, do you see exactly? God knows exactly where this king is. And not only that, in verse 18, did you see the way that God describes it? He says, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he's in the vineyard of who? Naboth. God knows exactly what's going on. God knows God is the one who is always just, and he will judge rightly. And it's a comforting reminder and also a confronting reminder for you and I that evil and destruction and all of its plans that are going on in secret, we might not know all the details, I want you to know the Lord God of the universe knows exactly what's going on. He knows and he sees. And this judgment, this, this fiery judgment, should cause both the readers then and us to almost shake, it is the very wrath of God being poured out on injustice, and rightly so. What's the judgment? Elijah arrives, Ahab's response, Oh, my enemy. It's like saying, I know who you are, I know why you're here. And in verse 20, if Elijah is actually his 
enemy, ultimately what he's saying is, Ahab is saying is, well, God is my enemy because Elijah is the, the Lord's prophet. And so judgment is given. You will die, Ahab. These are great verses, very confronting verses. I doubt very much there are mugs about these ones. Dogs licking, blood. You'll see a bit more in detail next week. There's disaster and destruction. There's this language of burning up. And in chapter in verse 4, it talks about cutting off every male. In other words, no descendants will be left standing. No one, no, no um, heritage of yours will exist. Even your male servants, they'll be cut off. And in Jezebel has also got her day coming. I mean, this whole language, it sounds very, um, for us, particularly in our day and age, it sounds almost very confronting, doesn't it? You know, imagine reading this with your kids. Some parents might be hesitant to do so, but it's in the Bible, right? But here in this moment, the language of blood and dogs eating, the, the visual picture that's given for us is to say generations are going to be destroyed. Even the birds eating, it's a confronting image to say that the very wrath of God, the anger of God, the just anger of God will be poured out on injustice. No one will escape for their sin. God is just. Sin has to be dealt with. And he will totally wipe it out. Their sin, you see in verse 20, because they've sold themselves to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 22, because you've made Israel to sin. And we even have the very summary verse in your passage. See the brackets there in verses 25 to 26? There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols as the Amorites had done whom the Lord had cast out before the people of Israel. This is God's righteous, holy judgment. He's bringing justice towards this sin. The evil is ultimately rejecting the very law of God and his very commands as a king. Ultimately what he's doing is establishing his own law and rule. Ahab is guilty. Not only that, he's taken the whole nation to worship idols, which is totally breaking the law. It's one of the biggest commandments at the very start of the commandments. So he's already broken the law. He is guilty. And what does this require? According to Scripture, it requires death. Sin leads to death. Not just them, in this very passage, anything or anyone connected to that whole line and kingship. Full on, isn't it? It's meant to. See, the very God of the Bible, some people say this often, I've heard this sometimes, I've, I used to think this as well. Oh, there's the God of the Old Testament and there's the God of the New Testament. Friends, I want you to know the God of the Old Testament and New Testament is exactly the same God. And in this moment, it's a reminder to us that he will not let injustice keep going. He has to deal with sin. It won't go unpunished. It's a moment for the readers then at that time and for us to feel the very holiness of who God is, the creator of the universe. And not only for Ahab to hear it and for the people to hear it, perhaps even feel it in their very bones, in their very heart. God is just and he will bring justice to any unjust or injustice but also in this moment we're going to about to see god is in the mix of that justice is merciful have a look in that moment you would think that Jeze jezebel and ahab they've had it they've got it coming and what happens in verse 27 and when ahab heard these words he tore his clothes put sackcloth on his flesh fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about dejectedly did you see that? The very actions in the passage here are really quite common in the Old Testament, and later on you will see some aspects of that in the New Testament. The very actions of tearing clothes, the very actions of sackcloth and fasting, something has finally happened to this cowardly, rebellious, deceptive king. He seemed to have turned 
he seems to have responded to this judgment that's upon him. God sees and God hears, and God's response is filled with mercy in this moment because he sees that this king is not faking it. It's not just some sort of religious thing. Something has happened. Did you see that in verse 29, what's happened? Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? I've always wondered in that moment what Elijah would have felt. Uh, Perhaps the people, maybe the people in exile. But in this moment, God relents on the life of Ahab. Disaster will not actually come specifically on him in his days. He receives grace, but his sons will experience the judgment. In other words, that the judgment will still happen as God said. God's word of judgment brings grace and mercy towards someone who has finally humbled himself in this moment. It wasn't until Ahab humbled himself who was able to receive the mercy of God. It's not until he humbled himself that he was able to receive the mercy of God. Friends, in these three stories of the Old Testament, sometimes we can miss. You've got to remember the amount of years that this has been going on how long-suffering and gracious the God of the Bible is, the God of the universe, the God who is still the same today. Now, I want you to consider for a moment, this guy is not only an idol worshipper, he's murdered someone, he's taken a whole nation, one half of the nation, to turn away from God. And he's actually spared in that moment for him the consequences. He's actually shown mercy from God, who is just. Only when he humbled himself. Some of us in this moment may automatically go, wow, how gracious is God, how merciful he is. And I would say, yes, amen. And there are some of us that cry and go, hold on, that's just not fair. Injustice. See, friends, in this moment, you've got to remember, if the audience of the Uh, of this particular passage are the people in exile, perhaps even in them, as they're in exile, they've experienced God's rebuke and being sent out to exile. Maybe even in this moment, it's for them to even consider if God is merciful to Ahab, perhaps he will be merciful to us. So imagine for a moment that person in your world or any kind, in our times, let's kind of bring it in here a little bit more. Imagine for a moment if there is someone you have experienced injustice from. Maybe it's that individual at work keeps mocking you because of your Christian faith. Maybe it is that uh, family member also doing the same. Maybe it's that uh, political party that you cannot stand or that political leader that you cannot stand for. And as you arrive to your small group or your church service, they're there. And you think to yourself, what are you doing here? And they turn around to you and say, you know, you wouldn't believe what happened to me. I heard about Jesus, I explored it, and I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour. Do you know that moment, that feeling that you might have? Some of us might turn around and go, I don't know about this. Let's see. I've got some questions for you. Give me the books of the Bible. No. Some of us might say, that's amazing. Some of us, there's this moment where we just go, that's just not fair, because it's like when you play Monopoly, they got the get-out-of-jail-free card. Right? Maybe it's just me. Friends, in this moment, the Scripture is here to confront our hearts with the very beauty and glory and holiness of who God is and His beauty and glory as the God who is just and righteous and will deliver mercy to anyone who humbles themselves. And the reality, friends, is if God is holy, he must deal with the sin of our rejection of him ultimately, of selling our own hearts to do what is evil. Ultimately, you and I are all tempted to worship something or someone else, to make our own God. We've all done this. I've done this. That moment when we covet, that is to want something more than God, to want that thing, to not be content in what God has provided for us. We're all guilty, aren't we? 
Let me read something for you. These are Jesus' words. When he talked about anger when he was here on this earth. In Matthew 5, you remember. You've heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Friends, are we angry with anyone today? A brother or a sister in Christ. What about Jesus talking about lust? You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. So all what Jesus is doing in this moment in the Sermon on the Mount, he's quoting Old Testament scripture. And he's saying, you've heard it said, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman, and even in our context, man, with lustful intent, has already committed adultery. Do you see the bar that Christ is lifting? He's declaring, this is what coveting is. We're all tempted. If you've even looked in any way, you've coveted. So in this moment, it's a reminder to us a holy God requires justice and his wrath is against all who are unrighteous. And what is God's solution, dear friends? And this, should I pray, will cause your heart to sing that we are, thankfully, true justice is not dependent on you or dependent on me. It is ultimately fulfilled and shown through Jesus Christ the God's son, his son, the true king, the one not only who proclaimed these truths, but who fulfilled these things perfectly, the one who is holy, the one who is perfect, the one who on this earth was tempted in every way but did not sin, and the one who fulfilled everything that was required of the law, the one who was also accused for blasphemy the one do you remember when he was facing the actual accusations in the gospel of matthew it's up here on the screen that screen it's here with caiaphas at the council they seize him they even bring um false witnesses against him the 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 whole false witnesses with initial ones they couldn't even actually put the the stories together but eventually These false witnesses in verse 59 says, Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking the false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none through many false witnesses came forward. And at last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. The high priest turns around to the... Hears these false witnesses, turns around to Jesus and says, Have you got no answer? Jesus, and what is he doing? He's silent. He's silent. Then they ask him, are you the Christ? Are you the Son of God? And he said to them, you have said so. And then Jesus proclaims this beautiful, powerful truth that the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of power coming on the clouds of heaven and they can't handle it anymore. They tear their clothes, all this kind of imagery that we've heard and they cry out blasphemy against Jesus and they say, what judgment is this guy deserving? And they say, death. Death. He deserves death. And they spit on the Saviour's face. They slap him and they say, prophesy. Prophesy to us, Christ, who has struck you. Do you feel the mocking against our Saviour? And friends, before we say, those guys, we're right there in that room. This is the one who is perfect, blameless, accused falsely. He's silent He declares only what is true. And the very hardness of their hearts is to say blasphemy. And what do they do? They take him. They go take him to the cross. Where was the cross? It was outside the city gates. And then he himself, the son of God, takes on the full righteous judgment of the father and bears the justice for our sin because of us. The just one dies. The one who is perfectly humble, humbled himself to die the death that you and I deserve. And because he humbled himself, he is now exalted, sitting, as we heard this morning, on the right-hand side of the Father, ruling and reigning. The one who is truly God. The one who was raised again on the third day because he is God. The one who has brought true justice for our sin. Justice is met through Jesus' sacrifice and death and resurrection. And so what now? 
Romans, Paul, the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans 10 this way, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And to be saved is to realize, to look to our humble Saviour, the one who took our place. So you know what this means, friends. If you're someone who's exploring the Christian faith, the God of kings, the story of kings, is the same God today. And whether you realize this or not, you have sold yourself to something or someone else to be your God, and you're enslaved to that God. Perhaps you might even think to yourself that you are worshipping yourself ultimately, or ultimately you're someone who's enslaved to the God who says, you're good, you're fine. And you're constantly trying to be good. You're constantly putting pressure on yourself to be the right person, but you feel the emptiness in your heart that says, I am feeling uneasy, I am empty, I'm always thirsty because I keep filling my life up with many things. And it's not till you come face to face with the one who humbled himself in order to save your thirsty soul. He offers true fulfillment. Turn to humble yourself today and cry out for mercy. Followers of Christ, did you know pride is one of the most deceptive, constant sin that Christians have to put to death daily? And if you are someone who has achieved humility, I would love to talk to you. I'd love to learn from you. See, followers of Christ, pride is something that always knocks on our door. It rears its ugly head in many ways, doesn't it? It rears its ugly head in our home. It rears our ugly head at our, at our workplaces, at our schools, at our unis, in our various seasons of relationships that we have. Even it, believe it or not, and if you're visiting Canterbury Gardens, I want you to know that pride even rears its ugly head in our church in different ways. And today, pride can be blasted out instantly, quickly, for all the world to see as you tweet, as you update your Facebook status, whatever it might be. It's there for everyone to see. So what do we do? How do we fight pride? See, in this moment, some of us might say, well, aren't you talking about justice, God is justice? Yeah, but to fight pride, we need to firstly and foremostly humble ourselves and gaze at the one who's truly just, beautifully shown in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And to tackle pride, it's not just gritting our teeth and being quiet and just sit down and just not saying anything. No, rather, it's to have our hearts to look at Jesus, the true humble one, who humbled himself and took on him God's judgment that was set for us in order to save us because Jesus humbled himself, as it says in Philippians. And because he humbled himself, he's exalted. And that's who we look to, to fight pride. This is the very engine room for all Christians that we are declared to live, do this. And you know what? The beauty of this is, if in our church calendar, I don't know if, because our church doesn't do church calendars, but in the church calendar in general, today some churches just celebrate as Pentecost Sunday. And the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us, empowers us to say no to the sin of covetousness. And when we do, he's the one who convicts us and we can cry out for mercy because God has humbled us and God is gracious to us because we belong to him. The Holy Spirit, he's the one who causes us to have a posture of humility. Even particularly in our day and age with those who disagree with us, perhaps even with people who don't like us. Sometimes I think the greatest witness are people who are so humble in their lives and their following of Jesus that even the non-Christians end up liking them even though they disagree with them because I think they're seeing Christ in them. Perhaps with those loved ones or work colleagues but maybe even, even the language of this here in this passage should stir something in those of us who have loved ones who are deliberately turning away from the Lord and you think to yourself, how far is too far? Friends, this passage reminds us, not for God. And so we cry out that God would humble them just as he's humbled us. 
And there are those of us as well who say and look at this and go, yeah, I'm terrible, I'm always bad, I'm always bad. Friends, it's not about you trying to build yourself up and become worthy. No, that's not the whole point of this passage. The idea of this is to say, to turn around to one who is worthy, who has made you worthy because you're in him and there is no longer any condemnation for you. And then there are those of us who are personally love justice. We yearn for justice. This passage and the gospel reminds you and I, evil has had its day when Jesus cried out, it is finished. And evil and injustice will have its final day when Jesus comes and wipes away every tear. When our king returns to call us home. God's justice is true. His justice is revealed and fulfilled in Jesus, his son. And now he calls us to humble ourselves as followers of Christ to depend on his mercy, not in moments, but every day, to live humble lives for his glory. So friends, in conclusion, I just want to put some questions up here for you to consider. Does the truth that God is just, is just bring you comfort and hope? Or do you feel like it's always up to you? When was the last time you said, I am wrong, to that person that's closest to you, maybe even this person in this church? Is there anyone in your life right now that you consider that you're better than them? In your home, in your workplace, wherever God has placed you. To pursue humility is by looking at our humble saviour, the one who has ultimately shown us what true justice is. And so we bow at his feet. Would you join with me in prayer? Oh, gracious God, if it wasn't for your son, we too would be lost. If it wasn't for our saviour who humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross, we would be lost. And so this morning, as we sing this last song, may it be a call of worship to you. Oh, Holy Spirit, press into our hearts and change us. Have mercy on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.